theology is thinking about God. The more accurate you think about God, the better your relationship will be with Him. And sometimes people have a, a theology of God. They think about God sort of as a good luck charm. Well, He's going to take care of all my needs. He's there when I need Him, but that's kind of it. Some others will see their whole life is about living for Him. Well, the disciples were learning a lot about Jesus, but they still had some bad theology, some wrong theology, and they needed to learn and, and grow in that. They needed to know who Jesus was, really. They had been with him for three years. Think about that, in school for three years with Jesus. They had seen and heard some miraculous things, and they still didn't get it quite right. We need to be careful that we don't ever think we've got it just right. We need to keep striving to know Jesus better and better. So Jesus took them aside. It says after six days. That's after six days. Another gospel says the eighth day. And so uh, we don't know exactly how many days, but it was after the sixth day. They went up on the mountain. He took Peter, James, and John, took them high up on a mountain by themselves. The reference to a high mountain would reference authority. Jesus was the authority. And sometimes we need to separate ourselves from all the distractions, the entertainment, everything that keeps our mind from focusing on who Jesus is and what God would be saying to us, speaking to us about. We need to get aside a little bit, have our quiet time, apart from everything else, and read our Bible and let him speak to us through his word. So Jesus took him aside. The three disciples were overwhelmed with the vision. I think I would be too. And they, somehow they knew it was Moses. Somehow they knew it was Elijah. The Greek word in English is metamorphos. And a change. It speaks about a change. And in the Greek, it's a passive word. It's not something Jesus did to himself. It's something that was done to him. God the Father did this to him. He didn't go up there and, and make it happen. In verse 2, he's transfigured before them, and his face shined as the sun, and his garments became as white as light. His garments were very bright. When the scripture speaks of garments, it speaks about deeds. It talks about his life. And with Jesus, they were pure. And they, they give a revelation, all these different facets of revelation, about who Jesus was and is, the Son of God. When the scripture says son of God, it's referencing that he is God himself. Moses and Elijah suddenly appeared. There they were. And Moses represents the law. You remember when Israel came out of Egypt and they were at Mount Sinai for about two years and Moses would go up and talk to God and come down and go up and down. He went up and down a bunch of times. He'd go talk to God and God would tell him some words of the law or what's come to know, we know is the law. He'd tell us some words to live by, and he'd go down and tell the people, and the people would agree, and they'd ratify it, and he'd go back, and God would tell him some more. He'd go down and tell the people. And so he represents the law. Ultimately, God wrote it down on stone tablets, and there they had the law written down. Elijah represents the prophets. He was a great man of faith, and he prophesied, and it came about. When he spoke, it came about words of God. Now, if you remember, Moses went up on a mountain when it was time for him to die, and nobody knows where he was buried. The scripture says God buried him on top of whatever mountain he was on. And Elijah was taken up in a whirlwind, and he also has no grave. Great men of faith represent the law and the prophets. And so Moses and Elijah were speaking to Jesus. And verse 4 says, But Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it's good. Is it proper that we are here? Do you want us to make three booths? Now, there again, Peter, instead of waiting for a word from God, a word from Jesus about what to do, he had a solution. He wanted to make three booths, one for Moses, one for Elijah, one for Jesus. And the problem with this, scripturally, the problem with this is that puts Moses and Elijah on the same level as Jesus, and they're not. They're just men like we are, people like we are. They were great people of faith, but they're just people, and Jesus was God himself. 
And so he's the only divine son. The whole transfiguration events about the divinity of Jesus, God's son. He is Lord. He is God, eternal God. So the disciples were then instructed. Verse 5, And yet he was still speaking, and beheld a bright cloud overshadowed them, and behold a voice from the cloud saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Him you listen to. Jesus is the one that instructs us. We know that our Bible is the Word of God, and we know that Jesus is the Word. And so we listen to him. We listen to what he says to us in his word. Remember in the book of Job, how Job had his affliction, sickness, and loss of everything. And the, the, the Bible says he never lost his faith. He kept his faith in God. But he had some complaints that he voiced to God. He said, if only I could have an audience with God. If I could have my day in court with God, and I could, I could write this wrong, that I've not done anything wrong, I've lived a righteous life, and all this has happened to me, and it's just not right. And he went on and on. His friends said, well, he must have sinned and all kind of garbage. And finally, after all that confusion, the Scripture says, and God spoke. And when God spoke, he said, Job, where were you when I created the world? Where were you when I put limits on the ocean? Where were you when I put the parameters there? And where were you when I created day and night and the constellations and the stars and the animals and the fish and the birds? Where were you when I did all that? And the scripture says, Job repented. He changed his thinking toward God. So he had to change his theology too. Our theology needs to grow. It needs to be broader. It needs to be greater for that. But here, it's the same thing. The disciples had or Peter anyway, had some ideas. God the Father said, listen to what Jesus says. Listen to him. We need to hear him. He said here, and the word here would be here with the intent and purpose for obedience. It's Jesus that's going to take us out of this world of sin. It's Jesus that's preparing a place for us. It's him we need to listen to and be guided by. And that's why... It, it's a must that we must listen with a way and a, an intent of obedience to his word. And the disciples, after hearing this, they fell on their face and they were afraid. And Jesus came to them and said, Be risen. Do not be afraid. Do not fear. And the way the Greek is written here, rise up, would be, indicating that the disciples were so overwhelmed that they needed some help to get up, and Jesus had to go help them get up. They fainted away. They lifted up their eyes, and they did not see anyone except Jesus alone. And so transfigured shows the identity of Jesus in a manifest, visible way that the disciples actually saw. It's important to have a right understanding of who our Savior is. He's not just some man that lived a righteous life. He wasn't just some miracle worker coming to the world. Not just someone who rose from the dead, however that may have happened. He is God. From eternity to eternity, from eternity past to eternity future, he is God. Fully man and fully God. The scripture says he came in the flesh, incarnate, God incarnate. He was fully a human being, fully God at the same time. And we don't understand that in terms we can understand because we're finite. And these are infinite terms. We take it by faith. By faith you're saved. By faith you trust in it. You trust God's word to be true. Jesus is unique and the only Savior. There is no other and no one greater than Jesus. There's never a time he didn't exist. Now, many have declared themselves to be God. Uh, the pharaohs of old would say they were God. Uh, one or two of the Roman emperors, I think, declared themselves to be God. Others throughout history have declared themselves to be God. But they're still in their grave. They died, and they didn't come back. Jesus was put to death, but he came out of the grave. So for somebody to say, I follow Muhammad, or I follow Buddha, or Confucius, or the New Age movement, or I'm just, I do my own thing. 
All those are just excuses for not trusting in Jesus as your Savior. To be real honest, you may just say, I'm denying Jesus. I'm refusing to trust in him. I'm going to live my own life. And many in the, many in the world do that. Some like to have an excuse, say, I followed this or I followed that. But all those leaders are still in the grave. Those leaders teach that you need to die for them. You need to die physically for them. Jesus taught that he would die physically for us, for our sin, so that we could live for him. Our death is we live for him. We give him our life. He died for us. And then Jesus continued teaching. Even after the great revelation of the transfiguration, he, he still knew the disciples needed to learn some more. We never fully arrive. Now, we like to think we know it all because we know how we're going to do church. And we're politically connected in church. We know each other. If you want something to get done, you know who to go see to get it done, and you can have it however you want, all this kind of stuff. But do you know the Bible? You really know the Bible. And these are prominent characters in the Bible. And you know, do you know where the Moabites and Ammonites came from? That's a terrible story, but you know, where did they come from? And do you know that? Do you know your Bible? Do you know the Word of God? And so much of it, we don't know. But we think that we're great scholars in Scripture and that we know the Bible, we know the Lord and all this. And do we really? And the point is, we need to learn. We need to let our theology grow, what we think about God grow. It can't grow unless we learn more of Scripture and have more intake in the Word of God. It doesn't, take, it doesn't matter how old we get. We haven't arrived. You could be a hundred and something, and you haven't arrived yet. You still have more to learn. And we have to approach it in humility, not in the pride of, I know John 3.16, I've read the Bible once. That's just a bunch of pride that keeps us from knowing God. We need to submit ourselves to him and say, Lord, I know I don't know you as I need to. Teach me more. Show me the way. And don't let your pride and arrogance hinder your faith, because it certainly can. In verse 9, coming down from the mountain, he said to them, Nothing you say in regard to this vision until the Son of Man, Messiah, rises from the dead. And the problem was that the thought of that day had come down to there were two messiahs, one would be a suffering servant, the other a conquering king like King David. And the people were hoping for the conquering king. They weren't looking for a suffering servant. Well, we know in our better theology and better understanding of Scripture that Jesus was both suffering servant and a conquering king. And the first time he came, he came as suffering servant, and he suffered immensely at the hands of the religious and governmental leaders of Israel. And he died on the cross in a cruel fashion, a suffering servant, taking our sins on himself in that suffering. He's going to return one day as a conquering king. And he's going to conquer the world, all the nations that come against Israel. And those that will be saved are those who put their faith in him. Gentiles are included with Israel. Israel's never replaced. And some say Israel is replaced with Christians. And I've heard that the Christians... In, in the United States, have replaced Israel. I was reading a book the other day that about two or three hundred years ago in France, the French thought Christians in France replaced Israel. We don't upsert God's authority. God's chosen nation is Israel. And so we will be grafted in as Gentiles and included with those who are saved as we have faith in him. But we have to have the right theology. We have to have the right Savior. We have to put our faith in the right thing. And it's in Jesus Christ, who is God himself, who died for us so we can have eternal life. In verse 10, the disciples ask him, saying, Why therefore do the scribes say Elijah, uh, that Elijah, that it's necessary for him to come first? That's from Malachi in the last chapter, where Malachi the prophet speaks of that. 
Jesus answered and said to them, Elijah comes first and he will restore all things. But I say to you that Elijah has already come. And he said, I say to you, Elijah has already come, but they did not recognize him, but they did what they wanted to, they desired. Thus also the Son of Man is about to suffer by them. And so the disciples came to understand he was talking about John the Baptist was the Elijah to come. But there's not a sense here that they recognize that Jesus was going to die and come back. They still didn't get it. Not until he did. And we know they didn't get it because the day, the third day after he died, they weren't at the tomb waiting to see him come out. They were still expecting him to be dead. So we know they didn't get it until after he did rise from the dead and appeared to them many times and taught them even, even further. But John the Baptist called the people to repentance. He spoke of, of faith, from truth. He stood for the truth of the commands of God, and they put him to death. And Jesus said, they'll do me the same way. They'll, they'll treat me how they want to and suffer and die. It's only when we understand the identity of Jesus that he is God. He is our Savior. We need to understand that thoroughly. He's a Savior that will come to bring eternal salvation for us, to all who believe in him. But we also need to understand that not only is he Savior that we give our life to, we give our life to him every day. We wake up in the morning with Jesus on our minds of how we can better serve him, how we can make a difference in the world around us because he's in our life. We give our life to him daily to serve him, to learn from him, and to be a blessing to others. When we give our life to Jesus Christ, it's no longer about us. It's about him. But when we're about him, he gives us a promise that none can match. That's eternal life in his heaven. When we come to him, we come with repentance. That is a change of mind and humility. We recognize him. It will enable us when we come to him to bear fruit that's pleasing to him when we submit to him. And when we do his will, we produce fruit that's pleasing to him. Jesus is our Savior. He alone he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh the Father except by me. And so by trusting in him, we know eternal life. And we live for him each day. So how you think about God is important. The closer you are in your relationship and understanding, the better your relationship with him will be. And so we want more accurate theology. We want to think about God in a better way. Each day, a little better. Each experience taking us closer to him. And as we continue to think about God more and more accurately, we'll have a better and better relationship with him. As we have a better relationship with him, there will be a desire within us to serve him even more. And then we'll understand even more blessings, more and more, as we know him better each day. As you think about these words, these truths, think about your relationship with God. You recognize that you don't really fully know God yet. You still need to grow. You still need to know more about him. He has more to reveal of himself to you. And he wants to reveal himself to you so he can bless you even more.